it's a great joy to be with everybody this morning, this evening, this afternoon. And uh, it's a real blessing to participate in such a marvelous prayer time. And thank you so much, Pastor Stephen, for that uh, wonderful introduction, uh, setting the theme and the focus of our meeting. I'm speaking today to you about intercession, and this will be a three-part series over the next um, a few weeks, every Wednesday. And this is a very vital subject, and we'll begin the first part today, the subject of intercession. What does the Bible have to say about it? And what type of people should we be in order to qualify to be intercessors? There's no doubt that many people call themselves intercessors, and in fact, you meet them everywhere today. It's, it's just a, quite astonishing. But uh, are they really intercessors? And do they qualify in terms of what the Bible has to say about this very important and vital ministry? So we go, first of all, to the book of Isaiah, chapter 59. And uh, we have a, a, a remarkable little segment of verses here, beginning with verse 15, Isaiah 59. And we read, so truth fails, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. So he's talking about conditions that are really bad in the world, where truth is rejected, it falls to the streets, and if someone follows truth and the values of the Bible, uh, they become a prey. People hate them and feed upon them. And then we read, then the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. And he saw, notice this, that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. So the Lord found himself astonished that in a world of great wickedness and evil where truth was trampled on and people rejoiced in unrighteousness rather than righteousness, the Lord was amazed that he really couldn't find an intercessor. So we have to ask the question then, and, and this is the subject of today's study, the need for intercession the need for intercession. So we have this type of refrain reflected in other parts of the Bible. For instance, if you go to the, the great book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel 22, and, uh, and we turn up verse 30, Ezekiel 22, and we turn to verse 30. We, we find that we read this statement, and he says, So I sought for a man among them who would make a war and stand in the gap, notice that, before me on behalf of the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found no one. So again, there's this rather remarkable statement that intercessors are not to a penny, to use a British saying. In other words, they're not everywhere. And, um, and God looked for someone who would, who would somehow stand in the gap and uh, fulfill his purpose in the world, but he couldn't find them. And uh, we know, of course, that the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy tells us in chapter 2 that intercession needs to be made on behalf of kings and those in authority. So the need for intercession is really well stated in the Bible in a sort of a alarming manner. And uh, we have to then say that intercessors are those who get between God and men in an attempt to temper the judgment of God with mercy and grace. I'll say that again. The definition of an intercessor is one who gets between God and men in an attempt to temper the judgment of God with mercy and grace. 
So that's the particular role of an intercessor. We find that thought reflected in the book of Habakkuk, chapter 3, where the prophet, who is an intercessor, uh, realizes that the nation is hurtling toward judgment and an awful judgment that God tells him about in that the Babylonians are coming uh, to cart them away into exile. And he gets into this place of prayer and he's overcome with the thought of what's going to happen. And this is what he said, O Lord, I have heard your speech and was afraid. In other words, I've heard of impending judgment, and it, it's filled me with a certain amount of fear. Then he says, O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. So here's the intercessor who's getting into the gap and tempering, attempting to temper the judgment of God, the coming wrath of God with mercy and grace. So we have reflected here the definition, indeed, of an intercessor. And uh, you see this picture in the book of Exodus. I'm sure you know it uh, in Exodus 31, where, where God is going to destroy Israel. And he tells, he tells Moses, get out of my way because I'm going to break out against them because of their wickedness and the building of a golden calf, etc., etc. And And Moses gets in the way. He, he refuses. He stands in the gap. And uh, he tempers God's judgment with mercy and grace. And you have that other wonderful picture of it where the nation of Israel grumbled and moaned and had great bitterness toward God for bringing them out of Egypt, in fact. And this angers uh, the God of Israel, and he threatens to break out with a plague against them. And Moses quickly calls on Aaron to get in between the nation and God. And, and, and to and to seek mediation and intercession. And so God relents. And you can read that, of course, in um, in the book of uh, Numbers, where that remarkable story is spoken about. So an intercessor, that's number 16, an intercessor then, is one who does for others what they cannot do for themselves. An intercessor is one who does for others what they cannot do for themselves. An intercessor is one who stands before God and men in an attempt to temper and moderate the wrath of God with mercy and grace. And that is what we are called to at this time, and we need to know that. In every respect, our world actually deserves an overwhelming judgment. And God looks over the world and sees how they rejoice in, uh, in uh, deception, contradiction of the truth, and assail the righteous. And he looks and sees there's no one to stand in the gap. So that's what intercession is all about. And that's what God is calling us into. But it also means that the, the caliber or the spiritual maturity of the intercessor means everything. Now, I want you to hear that. The caliber or the spiritual maturity of the intercessor means everything. In other words, in terms, and this is not talking about salvation now, but in terms of moving the hand of God, the quality, spiritually speaking, of the people who seek to do it and seek to be intercessors has to be of a special type. And that is true. It can be said, of course, that the ultimate intercessor was Jesus. And, and he had to have a remarkable quality in order 
to stand in the gap and to save us from the wrath of God. And, uh, and that remarkable quality was sinlessness. And uh, the Bible said that, says that uh, with great tears and crying, he went the way of an intercessor, died on the cross, got between God and man, and brought us salvation. But by the same token, I think uh, Stephen quoted uh, that scripture a moment ago, where he said, the effectual prayer of a righteous man avails much. It's not the effective prayer of any man. It's the effective prayer of a righteous man that avails much. In other words, God only inclines his ear to his true friends. God only inclines his ear to his true friends. And true friends have to be clothed uh, in his righteousness. They have to be totally surrendered to him. They have to walk with him. They have to know him. They have to be his friends. And, uh, and that, I think, is a challenge to all of us. I mean, are we really the friends of God? God looked upon Sodom and Gomorrah and saw Abraham. And he said, you know, I can't judge this, this city without talking to my friend. The Bible says that God saw Abraham as his friend. And so he, he spoke to Abraham. And the story, of course, is recorded in Genesis 18, 16 to 19, where Abraham then gets between God and the city and calls for God to have mercy. But the intercessor doesn't always succeed. We need to know that. You may get in the gap, but the overflowing wickedness of the world means that God may bypass him, although he will still communicate with him his intention, because the intercessor is his friend. So it's a remarkable story. And we find the same thing, you see, in, 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 in the book of Ezekiel. If you turn to Ezekiel 14 and uh, verse 14, and uh, this is a, a wonderful statement then that God makes concerning his friends in intercession. And he's referring to those who intercede. Listen to this. Even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, that is, in the world at that time, they would deliver only themselves by their righteousness, says the Lord God. In other words, God cares for his friends. All of these friends were intercessors. And God says, even if they were in the world, there comes a point at some time where he will not spare the world, the nation, the people. So an intercessor has to have a certain caliber. And uh, God inclines his ear to people like Daniel and Noah and Job and many others like Abraham. And uh, that's why a true intercessor is very hard to find. But the Holy Spirit is speaking to us today and calling us out after him. And I'm sure there are wonderful intercessors on this call. But are we really all intercessors? Because the road of an intercessor is one of many testings in order to qualify. And uh, we shall see that later, but it is reflected very powerfully in the life of Daniel. Daniel was a remarkable intercessor. And uh, his story is all about intercession. He's, he's getting in between God and men for the sake of Israel before some of the greatest empires in the world and some of the most ruthless, wicked people in the world. And so he's this intercessor.
but he pays a great price because the intercessor has to be faithful. God has to be able to trust him. And as we say sometimes in the English language, to hang his hat on him. Now, his hat is a symbol of who he is and, and his dignity and his purpose. And God hangs his hat on him. God is determined to give himself to him. And for that, the intercessor has to be a certain quality of individual. That's why James says, as I noted, it is the fervent prayer of a righteous man that avails much. So the caliber of the intercessor is very important. And, and I feel that God is challenging me, he's challenging you. Are you really an intercessor? Are we? Can God hang his hat on you? Can his purpose in Israel and the nations and our churches be changed because of you and me? Is that possible? So it's a challenge. It's a beautiful challenge because God is looking for friends with whom to work in the world. It's wonderful that God is looking for friends. So this means actually that the person called into a life of intercession, into the type of work that I've described, has to be skilled in rightly dividing the word of God. Has to be. The intercessor has to be skilled in rightly dividing the word of God. That means he has to know it contextually. He, he can't just dish up verses and quote them. And sometimes, and very much many times, these are all out of context. But the intercessor has to rightly divide the word of God and quote it and understand it in context. So this is such an important thing. Why? Because it's only by this process that he can really understand the purpose of God in the world. And an intercessor has to understand God's perspective at a certain point in time in terms of current events that are reflected in Scripture. And we see that so well demonstrated in the life of Daniel. In Daniel chapter 9, we read that he read in the book of Jeremiah that the exile of Israel would be 70 years. And he looked at his calendar and he saw that the 70 years were upon them. So because of his reading of the word of God, his understanding of the word of God in context, he was able to understand the perspective of God in terms of current events. And having received that understanding, he could then take the word of God and hold it up before God and bring him into remembrance of it. Now that requires a very special type of person. And that type of skill, says Paul, is so needed. He talks about the need for the people of God to rightly divide the word of God. You can see that in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. And to gain such an understanding actually is quite an arduous journey. It's a long journey. Intercessors don't pop out of anywhere. They come out of a journey of having been washed repeatedly in the word of God for years. And God is challenging us about it today. If ever there was a need for intercessors now to stand up before God, particularly on behalf of Israel, our nations, and not just pop off stuff that we think, but really Hold before God the things we know to be absolutely contextually true. And that is an absolute challenge of the Holy Spirit that comes to all of our lives. It is in the book of Isaiah, as you well know, 
in chapter 62, which is the basis of our global prayer gathering, uh, that the prophet says he's placed watchmen on the walls of Jerusalem. That is prayer watchmen, like Habakkuk on his prayer tower. There they are. God is put intercessors in a place of protection of his people. But the interesting thing about those verses is that it then states that they are to give him no rest until he establishes Jerusalem as a praise in the earth. In other words, they are to hold up the word of God as Daniel did. And they have to say, this is what your word says. This is the context of your word. And we are going to hold it up before you. We are going to knock at your door. And the, the imagery is good. You know, it's like, you're not going to go to sleep, Lord. <laughs> it's, a way, it's amazing. Give him no rest. Don't let him have any respite. Why? And why would you dare to do it? Because you are his friend. Not just anybody. You know, my, if my friend knocks on my door at midnight, I will open to him. Why? Because he's my friend. If someone else knocks on my door at midnight, I may not open. I may be disinterested. I don't want to know them. Because they're not my friends. So Jesus, in looking for intercessors, is looking for friends. It's only with friends that he shares his word. And by properly understanding scripture, the intercessor then is able to accurately determine God's perspective on current events and pray into them. And this is the unique calling that Jesus gives this group. This is the definition and the character of intercession and an intercessor. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you today and we thank you for your wonderful presence. We, we humble ourselves before you. We want to be those who love righteousness. We want to be more than that. We want to be those who love it so much and who are so surrendered to you that we can become your friends. We remember that you've said even over unbelieving Israel through your apostle Paul that they are beloved because of your friends, the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The nation remains blessed. Judgment is tempered. Grace and mercy will come to help them. Because of your friends, whom you have never forgotten. And today, Lord, we come before you. We ask you to forgive us where we have not been consistent where we have prayed, not really in the context of your word, but out of our own thinking and scheming. We pray today, Father, that you will make us into your friends and therefore into intercessors. I thank you for these wonderful people worldwide 
that have dedicated their lives to this. Today, we come before you afresh. And we ask you, Father, make us like Daniel. So when you look upon the world, you are not amazed that there is no man, no woman, who can truly stand in the gap. And Lord, today, amongst everything else, we hold your word up before you. We pray for Israel that you will deliver her Defeat her enemies. Establish Jerusalem as a place of peace and praise in the earth. For this is the promise of your word. Help us, Lord. We surrender ourselves to you. Let us be your friends in intercession in Jesus' name. Amen.